Stars go out each night. Let this be our prayer. And shadows fill our
Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you. You who are the creator and preserver of your creatures. I pray now that you will look with favor upon this man and this woman as they're about to be joined in holy matrimony. I pray that you will fill them with a sense of solemnity at the vows they are about to take before you and this gathering of friends and relatives. Fill them with a sense of joy as they contemplate the wonder of becoming one flesh, even as the Holy Trinity is one. And grant, O Father, that they will always look to you for assistance in fulfilling these sacred obligations and for grace, ever more grace, to ever enter into a deeper and deeper understanding of the mystery of marriage. Grant this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. You're good. No, no, no. Song on. Dearly beloved, we're gathered here to gather in the presence of God and in the company, the sight of this company, to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Marriage is an honorable estate. It's instituted by the God of creation, regulated by the God of revelation. This holy estate was honored by the Son of God in that the first miracle that he, cre he wrought on earth when he had three years to save the world was a wedding feast, a three-day wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. The Apostle Paul likewise exhorts people everywhere to honor this sacred institution and reveals that the, in the, the institution or the union that exists between a man and a woman in marriage points to a mystical union of a deeper reality. The reality of the union that the Lord Jesus Christ has with true believers, the ones that he died for, the ones that he will spend eternity making more beautiful, the church. Therefore, because of the honor and obligations which belong to the state of marriage, it's not something you enter into lightly, but soberly, reverently, in the fear of God. It's into this holy, this hallowed estate that these two people present themselves to be joined. Catherine, David, I charge you now before our great sovereign God that the covenant that you make here today carries with it both the gravest responsibilities and the promise of life's greatest joys, joy unspeakable. 
Enter now into this covenant with the fullest intent to fulfill your vows with one another with all the strength that God will give you. David, will you have Catherine to be your wedded wife to live with her after God's commandments in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, honor her, cherish her, treasure her above any creature or worldly possession in sickness and in health, forsaking all others so both as, so long as you both shall live? Will you? I will. Catherine, will you have David to be your wedded husband, to live with him after God's commandments in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love him, honor him, cherish him, and treasure him above any other creature or worldly possession in both sickness and health and forsaking all others so long as you both shall live? Will you? I will. Mr. Cartwright, thankful that God has given you, Catherine, these space of years and trusting care, nurture, and discipline to you and Mrs. Cartwright. Do you now unreservedly give her away to David, asking God's blessing on their marriage? Do you? Catherine, David, I don't even know where to start. Catherine, I have known you a long time. In fact, you're the embodiment of one of my long-cherished pastoral dreams. When I came to Collierville, one of the things I wanted to do was be a pastor in a place and see the whole arc of people's stories. I wanted to marry off the children I baptize, multi-generational faithfulness. The day this church was founded, I baptized you, your siblings, and your daddy 17 years ago. First day this church was founded. And now here in St. Patrick's new home, you're one of the first to be married. The sound man is the first back there. And now look at you. Here you are all grown up, a radiant bride marrying a great guy. A good old southern boy you had to go all the way to Colorado to find. <laughs> I've known you for a long time, and though I haven't spent a whole lot of time with you through the years, I think I see a lot of your grandfather in you, determined. You went off to Ole Miss when your parents were Alabama folk. You flew the coop to Denver to make it on your own apart from your daddy's money. You found a great church in Denver that has mentored and discipled you in the faith of Jesus. I'm so proud of you. So proud you're back to your roots, back with your people to celebrate what in a broken world is one of the greatest blessings marriage. David, I don't know as you as well as I do... Uh, these other people, but I will let you know this. When strangers come into our tribe to marry off our women folk, you can bet they're well vetted. <clears throat> Before I even hardly knew your name, I knew lots about you because I know people in Colorado. <laughs> and the fact is, I talked to your future father-in-law about you at length. And when he passed on you, that was huge. And I'll tell you why. He turned one guy down. Twice. Yeah. Straight up. No fear. It's impressive. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Bob told me how you were in Pickwick with the family. They asked for Catherine's hand and just always people around. I can imagine you about to throw up trying to do this all weekend and somebody would always show up. I'm sure he planned that. Finally, after two days, putting a boat up, you got the courage to do that, and that's a good thing. 
But then David got a little too confident. And the next time he saw his future and father-in-law, and he is from Alabama, out from Auburn, you might need to know that. And he said to Bob with the, with the, with the big grin, who is an Alabama alum, Mr. Cartwright, why don't you come with me and my family to the Alabama-Auburn game and sit in our box? There are limits to this thing. And Bob said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Some things grace can't fix, okay? <laughs> but it's all good. So here we are on this glad, glad occasion in God's providence, two children nurtured in the womb of the South, meet in Colorado, fall in love, and pledge their lives to each other here. And while marriage is sort of out of fashion these days, don't listen to the culture. Deep love doesn't fear commitment. It runs to it. Deep affection is not afraid to vow. It sees them as chains of freedom. So before you take your vows, let me give you a few things, a few thoughts about the glories and trials of marriage. And I'm reading from the book in the Bible about marriage, the Song of Solomon. This is from Song of Solomon 8, chapter 6 through 8, verses 6 through 8. Hear God's word. Hang my locket around your neck, wear my ring on your finger. Love is invincible facing danger and death. Passion laughs at the terrors of hell. The fire of love stops at nothing, it sweeps everything before it. Flood waters can't drown it, torrents of rain can't put it out. Love can't be bought, love can't be sold. It is not to be found in the marketplace. The word of the Lord. The whole book of the Song of Solomon in the Bible gives us the glorious possibilities of marriage. These verses described here talk about the kind of love that will make your home for years to come a foretaste of heaven. So I want you to see the goodness of God and what he has for broken sinners in the state of marriage. Because the institution of marriage is more than any other place is where you're going to experience God's love for you. Not perfectly because you're sinners, not completely because God has to be your ultimate lover. But marriage is the place with each other, exclusively, imperfectly, you'll experience ecstasy. You'll experience God's love made real. So because marriage has this, this sort of cosmic weightiness, and the possibilities of, of love and wonder... I mean, here we are. We got trees in a sanctuary. I've never seen this. Is that not amazing? And so we're here in pomp and circumstance. Blush, br brushed and floss, perfume, decked in our nines. About to feast like there's no tomorrow. To bear witness to you too. To take these vows. So let me tell you a couple of things about, a few things about marriage. Marriage for you will be a means of grace. You don't really marry because of love, but this institution will teach you to love. Let me explain. In marriage, you're asked to become one with another person, to commit to that love. Hang my locket around your neck. Wear my ring on your finger. One person, the beloved, will be the place where love is forged and learned. It'll be a battleground that will fight your selfishness and a playground of mutual life and laughter. You're asked to become love, the essence of love. Love that is invincible, that laughs to threats at your homes, that stops at nothing for the beloved. Tidal waves of hardship and disappointment can't ground it. The pressures of work, children, suffering can't make you cut and run from its demands. So here's the question. Can you do that? Can anybody do that? And historically, the people of God have said, no, not in our own strength. So that's why we publicly exact a vow from you. Now, ponder that. All of this to make you swear before God you're always going to be here. And, and here's the reason. As much as we hope good things for you, as much as we hope you look at each other just like this always, we don't trust your heart. And that's why we take a vow. All of us. 
Some of us, 35 years removed, took a vow, and it's, what's, it's the guarantee of intimacy because it'll make you always be there. Like Odysseus, when he was going by the Isle, Isle of Sirens, he said, lash me to the mass. I don't trust my heart. As much, as strong as I am, I might be tempted. So what we're doing with these vows is we're lashing you to the mass right here, lashing you to the mass of this marriage. Marriage is a means of grace because of that. But secondly, nothing will show you how selfish and sinful you are like marriage. You think you're good? Wait till you start living together. <laughs> Wait till you start living together. You, you, you think you're giving now? But here, here's the thing. Marriage will show you your need of the gospel. And you will just keep running to Jesus. You'll keep running to Jesus every day in your own strength. The, more, the weaker you are, the stronger you'll be. Two broken sinners continually confessing their need of Jesus will be two lovers people write stories about, even in Colorado. Marriage will force you to run to Jesus with your selfishness more than anything else. But secondly, and this is really good, marriage is sacramental. It makes something real. It makes the love of God real for you. Some have said the Song of Solomon is a book about Christ and the church. Don't listen to them. It's about marital commitment, faithful love between a man and a woman. It's wild, it's erotic, it's passionate, it's guarded. It's the kind of love that's possible. So that indirectly it speaks of how Jesus loves the church in a wildly passionate way. But here's the point. You'll know God's love's made real with each other. C.S. Lewis said, next, next to the blessed sacrament, the holiest thing you ever see is the face of your neighbor. So imagine to behold the beloved. Is, 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 I'm telling you, in, in essence, to serve one another is to see the face of God. It's to know God's love. The closest thing I know to God's love made real, a God I can't see, taste, touch, or handle, is in the face and the embrace of my wife. My own bride, Terry, makes God's love real. That's why it's sacramental. Years ago, it, it, this is a mystery you can't comprehend. I, I wrote a poem years ago trying to capture something of the essence of God's love, how we're experiencing in marriage. Let me read you just a, a few lines. Here in a small place is the order of the restoration. Time and eternity fuse. Eden is being restored. You, beloved, bear the image of God. You are ecstasy, a garden of delight. You are fire burning away my infamy. Abstractions melt away in your presence and touch. Cynicism gives way to affirmation. You bear a weight of glory. How good is that? To make God's love made real. The last thing, though, is it's a mystery. Marriage is a mystery. You confront otherness. Think about you think you know each other and you do, but there's always this mystery of otherness. The mystery of year after year, intimacy deepening, but you just continually uncover the new profound revelation that's your spouse. And in that sense, the person you know better than any in the world will always be a mystery. Not to be solved, but to be ever entered into in a more deep way. So I exhort you, Catherine, listen to me. Be Jesus to David. Listen to me, David. Be Jesus to Catherine. The whole mystery of marriage is realized in one symbol that you stand under right now, the cross. Charles Williams, a good friend of C.S. Lewis, said this. In Christianity, the cross is the center and there's no circumference. The cross is this. It's my life for yours. My life for yours. Not my life for me, my life for yours. And in marriage, you never outgrow this. You never outgrow it. So now, let's exchange vows. David and Catherine, you'll now speak your vows as you enter into this marriage covenant before these friends and loved ones. Okay, now, 
David, I'll ask you to go first. So take this vow. I, David, take you, Catherine. I, David, take you, Catherine. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. In sickness and in health. Sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to the holy ordinance of God. According to the holy ordinance of God. Do you have a ring? Okay, look, hang on one second. I'm going to say something different. Just, just like sacraments make things real. We're not Gnostics. We have bodies. We have senses. We perceive the world through senses. Christians most don't believe that. But God gives us bread and wine to make Jesus real. And for us, he gives tangible things. So we have rings. And so take this ring, put it on her finger, and take this vow. With this ring, with this ring, with this ring, <laughs> I seal my vow. I seal my vow. And offer it as a symbol and pledge. And offer it as a symbol and pledge. Of my constant faith. Of my constant faith. To this covenant. To this covenant. With my body, I honor you. With my body, I honor you. All my worldly goods, I share with you. All my early, earthly goods, I share with you. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, Catherine, you will now speak your vows. I, Catherine, take you, David. I, Catherine, take you, David. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. In sickness and in hell. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to the holy ordinance of God. According to the holy ordinance of God. Does you have a ring? Okay, so take this ring, Catherine. Put it on David's finger and take this vow. With this ring. With this ring. I seal my vow. I seal my vow. And offer it as a symbol and pledge. And offer it as a symbol and pledge. Of my constant faith. Of my constant faith. To this covenant. To this covenant. With my body, I honor you. With my body, I honor you. All my worldly goods, I share with you. All my worldly goods, I share with you. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And the Son. And the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Historically, wiser generations understood that a community had a vested interest in them having a great home of thriving. And so they made the congregation take vows all of those around them. And I found this in an older prayer book, so I'm going to ask you, friends and relatives, uh, to take these two vows that you will aid and assist Dave and Catherine so that their home is a place of thriving. Do you, loved ones and friends of David and Catherine, acting for yourself and on behalf of the body of Christ, assume responsibility to mentor and guide these newlyweds as they begin their lives together as man and wife? Do you? Do you commit yourselves to set a godly example before them to provide as far as you are able all that is necessary to help their marriage flourish? Do you? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the love that you have shown us in sending Jesus uh, to become one of us, to be born of a human mother. Uh, to live the life that we should have lived, to make the way of the cross to be the way of life. We thank you that in a small way that the love that David will show Catherine in their marriage will mirror the love that Jesus had in going into the far country, sacrificing fame, riches, and glory to go into the four country to die for his bride and then to spend eternity making her more beautiful. And Father, I pray that you will bless their union. I pray by, pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will pour your abundance of blessing upon them. 
that you will give them life and laughter, laughter, that you'll lead them into all peace, that their love for each other will make the love of Jesus real before them. I pray that you will bless them in their home. I pray that you'll bless them in the future. And finally, that they will uh, always, that they will know what it is to experience heaven together. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who through you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Y'all look at me now. Uh, David and Catherine, is your first act of marriage, I'm going to ask you to profess your faith in the gospel, in, Lord G, in the Lord Jesus, as you sink deep roots there. The greatest way to assure that you always look at each other like this is to, is to make sure that you're continually running to Jesus and professing your faith in him, and that he's your savior, not each other. So everybody stand with me as we profess our faith together. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Catherine, David, in the words of 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it is not rude or self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres, love never fails. You have made a covenant with God as its foundation, so I want you to go forth and fulfill your promises in the fear of God. And may your home be a place of refuge, refreshment, stability, and love. May it be a place of restoration, of great food and drink and laughter and joy, and may other people look at you and say, because they lived, because we were there, we knew a little bit of what heaven would be like on earth. For as much as Dave and Catherine is covenanted together in marriage, and by the authority committed unto me as a minister of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I do pronounce them man and wife after the ordinance of God. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. David and Catherine, as the psalmist asked this benediction for Israel, so I ask it for you. May the Lord give you increase. You and your children, may you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. David, you kiss your bride. May I present to you, Mr. and Mrs. David Kirik hand. <laughs> Just wait one second, one second. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks be to God for his good gifts and graces. Amen. Amen.